Hello, everyone. Um, I want to talk a little bit today about um, what I'm uh, <clears throat> calling a fin de race, end of a civilization, if you will, to borrow a phrase from um, Lebanese historian uh, Kamal Salibi. Um, <clears throat> of centuries now in uh, the Near and Middle East, the cross uh, has got trampled in the dust of Abraham. And I'm using the prophetic words here borrowed from uh, French historian Sébastien de Courtois, because for centuries in the Near and Middle East, for centuries now, in quiet desperation, uh, Christians have been succumbing, old quarters have been disappearing, neighborhoods have been taking stock of their dead, clergymen giving last rites, and unease uh, continues to grip uh, the precious few Christians left behind in vacant, dilapidated, uh, spiritual Disneylands. Another phrase that I'm borrowing from another French historian, uh, describing uh, what had become of uh, Near Eastern uh, Christians. And yet, the destruction of Eastern Christendom remains an order of things that raises no eyebrows. It is hardly a novelty the deliberate, methodical dispossession and outright erasure of the histories, languages, cultures, and memories of indigenous non-Muslim Middle Easterners is a saga 14 centuries in the making. Yet, normative Middle East scholarship and legacy Middle East punditry praise themselves for always identifying and, in, and indicting the same usual suspects, namely economic hardships and a vexing Arab-Israeli conflict that rankles even the wary, always conveniently sidestepping the root cause of the plight and the main drive behind the looming disappearance of Near Eastern Christians and essentially the end of Near Eastern Christendom, the, the, the Christians as a civilization. <clears throat> Still, a millennial attempt at clinging to their tenuous existence in an often hostile environment in their historical homelands, no less. The recent Christians have always aimed at persevering, at casting themselves as cultural intermediaries, as hyphens, as bridges, as it were, between East and West, transmitting to the Western world the faintest pulsations of the Near Eastern and Arab worlds, intercepting before anyone else the life ripples of the Mediterranean, of Europe, and of the universe, and then retransmitting them to the nations of the hinterland, to those desiccated realms of sands and sleepy mosques. Such is an element of an eternal truth, famously wrote Lebanese Druze chieftain Kamal Jumblat in 1945. And what I've read, you know, just a moment earlier, this is an exact quote from uh, Kamal Jumblat himself. Indeed, it is Near Eastern Christians who make the Near Eastern mosaic a mosaic. Without them, there is only a Middle East of blandness and slumbers and old shrines. And this is Still paraphrasing Jumblat here, who was himself not exactly a friend of Near Eastern Christians, still, in his telling, stayed austere, traditional, and rigidly ordered, the Middle East slumps in stark contrast to the dynamism, the edginess, the fluidity, and the intellectual audacity practiced by Levantine Christians, this unique breed of polyglot cosmopolitan cultural intermediaries. Indeed, the radiance of Greece and Rome, the splendor of Constantinople and Alexandria, and the church fathers themselves, from Ephraim the Syrian to Cyprian of Carthage to Clement and Augustine and Ignatius, this is not to mention the Jewish founders of Christianity themselves, all are Near Eastern, not Western, not European bequests. Greece and Rome and all that jazz. And just as Europe, as we know it today, may be unthinkable without a Paris, so would the diversity and flexibility and capaciousness and moral elegance of the Eastern Mediterranean be unthinkable without the region's enterprising minority peoples. Christians, 
and Jews and others to be sure, but Christians more specifically, because in our times, it is the Christians in particular who are the people on the verge of extinction. Under early Islam, spanning the 7th to the 10th centuries, Christian monasteries radiated a unique indigenous kind of polyglossia, maintaining a fervid movement of translation and diffusion of the scientific and philosophical traditions of classical antiquity. Indeed, long into the second millennium of the Christian era, the big picture, linguistically and culturally speaking, uh, in the Middle East had been one of uh, a congenital uh, multilingualism, a feature that is still a Near Eastern fixture and mode of being in our times. And so, in addition to the Arabic uh, brought along with the 7th century Muslim colonizers of the Near East, pockets of Aramaic, Hebrew, Coptic, Armenian, and Greek speech communities survive to this day in parts of Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Egypt, and Turkey. And this is not to mention Israel's biblical Aramaic and a revived uh, spoken Hebrew. It is precisely this distinctly Near Eastern Christian phenomenon that uh, made the intellectual radiance of 9th century Abbasid Baghdad possible, a world of Islam, as it were, that had become heir to Greek or Roman traditions precisely through the conduit of non-Muslims and non-Arabs. Near and Middle Eastern Christians in particular. And so, when one speaks of an Arab Islamic period of intellectual effervescence and transmission during the Golden Age of Islam, one is speaking of an enterprise that would have been impossible without Syriac Christians, Jews, Persians, and Indians, but especially, again, learned polyglot Near Eastern Christians replicating the same enterprise in modern times from at least the 19th century, so what, what, you know, what is commonly known as the Nahda, the, the Arabic um, uh, literary renaissance movement. Byzantium never forgot, famously wrote French historian Sylvain Guggenheim, noting that Near Eastern Christians were instrumental in the preservation and diffusion from East to West of the scientific and philosophical corpus of classical antiquity, a scientific and philosophical corpus that is Near Eastern Christian par excellence. And so even today, our modern world's most noble and valuable universal and humanistic of human endeavors uh, may likewise be attributed to the impulses and sens sensitivity of uh, Near Eastern minority peoples. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Quote. This is a reading from the first sentence of the preamble to the 1948 United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Humans, quote, are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. End quote. This is the, the, the continuation of uh, that declaration. Likewise, uh, Article 18 of that same declaration stressed that, quote, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change one's religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest one's religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance, end quote. It is not far-fetched imagining the authors of this Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the authors who were Israel's Abba Ibn and Lebanon's Charles Malik, uh, it's not difficult imagining them having had Near Eastern minorities in mind when they produced this famous document, Central Themes, uh, about 70, 70, 71 years ago. This is confirmed in a text uh, of Charles Malik's himself, written almost 30 years uh, later, in 1980, after the Declaration of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, in a text in which he affirmed that, quote, the future does not belong to oppression but to liberation. The future will not bring about a contraction of existing freedom in the Middle East, but a widening of its scope. 
the future will not conduce to the enlargement and grounding of slavery, but to diminishing its sway and getting rid of it altogether. The future does not belong to discriminating against the religious minorities, but to these minorities themselves winning complete equality in their responsibilities, rights, and obligations. The future does not belong to the realm of darkness, but to the realm of light, which shone and continues to shine in Lebanon. End quote. Now, it is, it is somewhat eerie to read these confident words of Charles Malik some 40 years later, not from Malik's Lebanese perch, but from, from a nearness so out of reach to it, gazing at a deformation of uh, Malik's idealized Lebanon, which had become not a realm of light as he had dreamt, but a twilight of impenetrable darkness. Yet Charles Malik's and Abba Ibn's were principles upheld and flaunted vociferously by Eastern Christians and Jews since at least the coming of Islam in the 7th century, and for our purposes today, since the dawn of the age of liberalism in the late 18th century Middle East. But this role assigned to near recent minorities, that of cultural intermediaries and, and healers and mediators, buying them time in an increasingly shrinking space for pluralism, uh, this role seems to have outlived its utility. Indeed, near recent Christians, an endogenous, indigenous lot by any measure, uh, they seem to have become one people too many in a Middle East that is today taken to unitary, uniform, homogenous um, um, space that, that, is, uh, that is considered to be overwhelmingly, if not exclusively, Muslim and Arab. Um, the numbers, despite the, the lack of uh, uh, credible, reliable censuses, the numbers do bear out the reality of the looming historical calamity. There's a sense of an impending fin de race among near recent Christians, noted Kamal Salibi in 2001. Um, a doyen of Lebanese historians and himself a Christian, uh, the body of Salibi's work had not been particularly sensitive to the plight of near recent Christians. Yet by the turn of the 21st century, Salibi had already begun admitting the obvious, uh, admitting that the collapse of near recent Christian history was very near at hand, that after 14 centuries of having been Islam's exemplars of affability and originality and innovation and reconciliation, uh, a sense of exhaustion uh, was finally setting in among them. They are too Christian in a space where pluralism is in decline, where religious extremism oppresses and kills, and where the world assents, appeases, submits, or looks away. The recent Christians tend to be intelligent, well-qualified, highly educated, noted Salibi, uh, and now they're simply opting to take their uh, skill sets, opting to take their skill sets uh, to more hospitable climes. It's a very serious matter, stressed Salibi, because each time a Near Eastern Christian leaves, no other Christian comes to fill his place, and that is detrimental to the Middle Eastern mosaic. Again, it is the Christians who keep the Middle East a Middle Eastern mosaic, rather than a monolithic Muslim world. And those are Salibi's words, not mine. Uh, but the die has been cast. In 1920, there were close to 3 million Christians in what is today Turkey. That number has dwindled to barely 300,000 in our time. That is to say... Uh, a drop from a robust 25% of the population uh, to what approximates today 4% of the population. And in the main, um, uh, those uh, Christians are elderly, uh, living a devalued existence on sufferance, uh, teetering on the edge of extinction. That's, 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 that's quite a dramatic drop from 25% of the population to barely 4%. Likewise, in 1952, when Jamal Abdel Nasser came to power in Egypt, there were almost half a million Egyptian Christians, other than the Copts, in what is now the 
uh, Arab Republic of Egypt. Today, following Nasser's liquidation of Egypt's age of cosmopolitanism, non-Coptic Christians um, don't exist anymore. In, 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 in a land that once called uh, St. Mark the Evangelist its patron saint and the founder of its national church, sort of like St. Patrick is uh, the founder of the national church of, um, of Ireland. Um, even the ancient Copts themselves, uh, which still number in the millions, couple of millions perhaps, uh, they're a pitiful specter of a once dominant, confident native Egyptian community, a group that had never been an avid uh, practitioner of immigration. The Copts are now leaving Egypt at alarming rates. And who is not familiar with the anguish and disorientation of Lebanon's Maronites? A community that, for all intents and purposes, had invented modern Lebanon, spawning its new republic as a confederation of minorities, to be sure, but first and foremost, perhaps, as a safe haven for persecuted near recent Christians. The Maronites who traveled uh, through history and through time with dignity, who, through 14 centuries of existence in an Islamized Levant, never lived as dhimmis, and indeed, for some time, exacted tribute from the wadis of Damascus, uh, the Maronites are now relegated to abject dimitude, divested of their historical, cultural, and political relevance, relevance and, and demoted to a position of servility, a, a kind of servitude whereby Christians live but are barely alive. With the proceeding in mind, it may be imperative, indeed it may be vital, that the plight of near recent Christians be looked at distinctly and separately from all the other problems plaguing the Near and Middle East. Uh, it is imperative that their, their troubled present days be viewed not as a reaction to nor as an emanation of the Arab-Israeli conflict, which is the traditional whipping boy, but their plight ought to be looked at uh, within the context of its own distinct history. Indeed, the plight of near-recent Christians is the sequel, perhaps even the culmination, of a long process of squeezing out, uh, a process of squeezing out that had begun with the 7th century Muslim conquest of the Near East, and that for a while had stopped at the foot of the Lebanon mountains. Uh, but that pause, uh, which might have lasted some 14 centuries, uh, that pause seems uh, possessed of a new kind of uh, dynamism, or that squeezing out process seems to be possessed of a new kind of dynamism uh, in this 21st century. Lebanon is now also being swept away in the tide of ascending religiosity and rising Islamic zeal. And so, from a people who wagered their survival on compromise and different iterations of Entente Cordiale, near recent Christians, after having been the region's cultural intermediaries, are now are times proverbial coal mine canaries, a warning sign, as it were, and an ominous indicator that the Near and Middle East are no longer hospitable to their pre-Arab First Nations. And yet in the West, the destruction of Near East and Christianity barely causes a stir. Mainstream media and Middle East scholarship hardly mention what in the Middle East is now business as usual. There is clearly a prevailing hierarchy in the media and in the academy's treatment of Middle East violence. Some Middle Eastern victims are worthy of academic conferences and research grants and BDS campaigns championed by indignant professors, and they get airtime on prime time all the time. Others simply don't receive uh, the dignity of being even mentioned. Near Eastern Christians are not a top priority. Uncouth, cross-wearing primitives, they are not woke enough to be cause for progressive righteous indignation. They are unfit for our world's moral gauge and outrage. They are too Christian in a world beholden to political correctness, to cultural relativism, obsessive intersectional infatuations with gender dysphoria and critical race theory and deconstructionist multiculturalist rigidity and lazy portrayals of the Middle East as a homogenous Arab and Muslim preserve, where only Arabs, 
and Muslims can be righteous victims, and where only non-Muslims are the perennial offender. This is arguably the saddest chapter in the Near East Christians' 14 centuries long sagas of dispossession. The West's ambivalence about its own moral values, the distortion and dismissal of the plight of Near Eastern Christians as a modern phenomenon, and the reduction of its causes to demonstrably apocryphal factors. This much is validated, for instance, by a uh, Los Angeles commentary published in early January 2011 um, on the heels of the New, Year, New Year's Eve uh, church bombings in Egypt, um, an editorial that claimed that in addition to the dwindling Egyptian Copts, quote, Authorities worry that Christian communities in relatively safe countries such as Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Iran are also shrinking, though driven by a search for economic opportunities, more so than by fear of violence. Middle Eastern Christians tend to be better educated and more Western-oriented than their Muslim compatriots, and often utilize family and religious highs abroad to emigrate, a patently r racist statement, but whatever, the woke won't notice that kind of racism. Um, incidentally, this patronizing LA Times analysis is in good company. In, in June 2009, the apolitical, tax-exempt, eco-friendly National Geographic uh, deemed it fitting to attribute the disappearance of Near Eastern Christians to, wait for it, um, the establishment of the State of Israel and the 11th century Crusades. Never mind that the dispossession of these first nations of the Middle East is antecedent uh, by more than a millenn millennium to both uh, uh, modern Israel and uh, the Crusades. Yet Arabs and Muslims of good conscience have indeed uh, begun issuing uh, summonses uh, to their own, calling their own to task, pressing them for introspection and scrutiny and accountability. Shortly after the fall of Mosul to the Islamic State, in a searing uh, July 2014 cri de coeur in the Kuwaiti daily Al-Qabas, Ahmad al-Saraf issued his own decent man's indictment of the crimes being committed in the name of his faith against the battered Christians of the Near East. In a combustive and Courageous tongue-in-cheek editorial titled Be Gone, O Christians, Sadaf facetiously in, in a diatribe lampooning the ISIS playbook noted that Muslims could not care less that the Near Eastern Christians may be the indigenous peoples of Egypt, Syria, Iraq. He still demanded that they still be expelled anyway, quote, so that Muslims would no longer be put to shame when their eyes meet the searching gaze of Christians wondering what had gone awry with Islam, end quote. Yes, be gone already, concluded Sarraf's editorial, and quote, take away with you your mercy, because with al-Nusra and ISIS and al-Qaeda and the rest of them on our side, the gangs of Muslim brothers and their latest, finest products we are scarcely in need of the Christian's mercy and compassion. Let the bloodletting commence. Let the violence reign supreme. Let the hearts get ripped out of their chest cavities. And let human livers get eaten raw. Let the tongues be torn out. Let the necks be hacked off. Let the knees get shattered. For we shall eagerly return to the medicine of old, to our herbal remedies and our old musty books of alchemy and witchcraft. Yes, be gone, Christians, and leave us be to our desert creed, for we crave the glint of our swords, the heat of our sands, and the energy of our mules. We scarcely need you, your civilization, or your scientific and literary contributions, for we have our own capital in abundance." Our own gangs of murderers and bloodthirsty butchers and executioners scram, you Christians, and spare us your civilization. We are replacing your culture of light with that of the grave diggers. End quote. That op ed is relatively recent, but, but its contents are symptomatic of a long standing epidemic that has, for 14 centuries, 
pitted the youngest of the children of Abraham against their elders. Perhaps before it is too late, the pendulum of the world's moral outrage may swing in favor of new recent Christians, or maybe in Luke the evangelist's words, if the world opts to remain silent, the stones may cry out, but until then, the latest chapter in the saga of destruction of New Eastern Christendom goes on unabated, and Assyrians, Chaldeans, Copts, Maronites, Armenians, and others, precious few remaining specimens of the world's oldest civilizations, quietly shuffle into extinction in mournful anonymity and oblivion. Their ancestral millennial homelands, now vacant, dilapidated spiritual Disneylands. Let me start my conclusion by saying the following about near recent Christians, near recent minorities, and minorities in general. This may have special resonance in our time with all that's going on with Afghanistan, the movements of people from, from their traditional homelands to other places, sometimes uh, forcefully uh, coerced, squeezed out. Um, this may have resonance not only because of um, the ethnic cleansing and the cultural genocide of minority peoples in the Middle East, but equally importantly, perhaps because of what's going on closer to home in, in an unraveling America today. When in the late 17th century, uh, Louis XIV the Sun King, uh, revoked his grandfather's uh, Edict of Nantes, which had granted at the time, 15, 15, 15, 1598 or so, it had granted Francis Calvinists uh, national rights and freedom of worship. Uh, when Louis XIV revoked uh, the Edict of Nantes, uh, the Calvinists, also known as the Huguenots, uh, were abused and persecuted, and eventually they were expelled from France. Uh, they went on to pollinate and enrich and contribute to the prosperity of other places, in Amsterdam and London and Berlin. And by that, they denuded France, if you will, of, of an important facet of its cultural heritage, depriving it of one of its most enterprising communities. Um, uh, FDR's ancestor, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, the Delano part of his name, De La Noé, I think, is originally, was a French Huguenot uh, who came on, on the, uh, on the um, um, forget the name of that, uh, on the Mayflower. Uh, right and uh, Calvin Coolidge is likewise a descendant of uh, those uh, initially what were initially French Huguenots, uh, but that you know had been expelled from France and ended up in uh, in Leiden or Amsterdam. Uh, there are many other examples like this. Um, uh, the, exa the 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 expelled Jews uh, and Muslims of the Iberian Peninsula in 1492. Uh, more clo closer to our times, the expelled Christians and Jews of Egypt during the pogroms of uh, the 1950s. Uh, children of my generation may recognize names like uh, that of uh, Georges Moustaki, Demis Roussos, Dalida, Kavafi, Batie Or, the famous uh, historian of the Dimmi, um, Guy Béard, the French uh, actor, Guy Béard, whose daughter is uh, Emmanuel Béard, uh, Claude François, those of you who are into uh, French song of the 1970s, this, this, this may have some relevance. Um, so Claude François, the writer of a song called Comme d'habitude, which uh, Michel Sardou sang in France, uh, became the signature song of an American icon, Frank Sinatra. Uh, well, Frank Sinatra's My Way was written by Claude François, and incidentally, the lyrics of My Way were written by another person whose ancestors were expelled from Lebanon and ended up in Canada and the United States, and that is a fellow by the name of Paul Anka. So Paul Anka, the descendant of sort of expelled minorities from the Middle East, 
uh, ends up collaborating with another son of uh, Middle Eastern ex uh Claude Francois. They collaborate on writing what becomes the signature song of an iconic uh, American crooner, uh, The My Way of uh, Frank Sinatra. And so uh, <laughs> this is to say that homogenizing nations, uh, expelling their heretics and infidels, although thought to be righteous, can indeed be disastrous uh, to the dominant culture. Think about this. Ciao.